Welcome back to Dasar. My name is Darshan Doshi and as a part of the personal finance and investment podcast series, I have an another brilliant guest today. His name is Parin Gala. Welcome Parin. Thank you Darshan. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, who is Parin? Parin uh, Gala is the Vice President of Research uh, and Fund Management and Accounting at Sage One Capital. Sage One, we're going to get to Sage One and we're going to hear from Parin what does Sage One do? Um, and how it can help uh, investors invest better and make money. But we are also going to talk about uh, small and mid cap stocks, investing uh, criteria, how do you think about managing your own money and personal finance. So we have a lot of uh, good discussions to have. I hope you enjoy this and find it useful. So Parin, I gave a quick overview of who you are and your, yes. you know, uh, research and lots of uh, years yes. of understanding the small and mid cap stocks yeah. uh, in the Indian context. Uh, you and I have had talks about That's different right. asset classes as well. Yes. Uh, but can you give a quick overview about what does Sage One do, the fund thesis, sure. the fund size and, you know, sure. what are you looking at? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Sage One Investment Managers is a SEBI registered PMS, uh, which started as an investment advisory in 2012, and we converted to a PMS in 2016. So the history is still there. And you know, Sage One has always been uh, investing in mainly mid cap, small cap, micro cap stocks over the years. Uh, today, Sage One, very proudly, we are uh, one of the large ones. So we manage almost uh, 2200 crores of AUM. Uh, I joined Sage One in 2018. That time we would be what? Maybe 220, 250. So the journey has been brilliant. Markets have been kind. Plus, obviously, our performance has spoken loads and investors have been hopefully happy with us. So, yeah. And uh, so Samit Vartak, uh, our founder and CIO, uh, is at the helm, uh, who drives Sage One. Uh, he's a great mentor. And, you know, lots of learning from him. And then we have a strong team now with research of maybe about we are six people and the team of 15 and going strong and hopefully much stronger. And so department. just on that, you know, uh, going from about 200 crore to 2200 crore AUM. Congratulations on that. Thank Looks you. like you are the lucky charm for uh, Sage One as well. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on a serious note, you know, what is the thesis? What are you what are you guys sure. looking at and what is the niche that you operate in? Um, so if you see Sage One predominantly uh, invests in uh, mid cap. So we have something called as an offering. We had uh, SCP, we call Sage One Core Portfolio, which has been since inception of Sage One. And that was a, a mid and small cap uh, portfolio where we invest in. So uh, if you see the uh, definition by SEBI, you know, so leaving out the top 100 market cap, which are the large caps. And from 101 to 250, that's mid cap and below 250 is your small caps. So our universe is that. So typically we would uh, invest anywhere between a 500, 600 crore market cap up to 30 to 40,000 crore. And uh, the lower you come, what happens is that uh, there's less research in such companies, you know, they are less identified. Uh, yes, right now with digital and you know information decimation being faster, it's now better uh, discovered. But earlier it wasn't that much, right? So that is where your forte lies. And see, investing in mid and small cap is a little tricky, you know, because there you have to really uh, deep dive into the businesses and all. You know, large cap companies they've already. Uh, are matured and you know a lot of research happens like in the HDFCs of the world, Asian pains of the world. But the smaller companies you don't find so much research. So where our forte lies, you know, deep dive, you know, a lot of channel checks happen and uh, a lot of meeting with uh, various vendors, supply chain guys. So it's, it's a long process and that's, and that's where our forte lies and that's how we have been able to do extremely well in picking the right stocks in the portfolio. So this is really good personally for me also, because I don't understand a lot of small and mid cap. So, uh, you know, a lot of this today's discussion is going to be very enriching for me because right. I normally I, I've worked a lot with startups Correct. and I understand the angel investment, seed funding, Correct. venture capital industry really well. 
um and then the large cap you know there's enough um investment advice Correct. or guidance uh, financial data yeah. available to do that Correct. but uh, the real action really takes place in the small and mid cap because these Correct. are the fastest growth companies Correct. they are beyond uh, startup stage they have Correct. some sort of uh, you know revenue certainty yes. yes but not enough cash flow Correct. potentially right That's so there's true. growth uh, challenges that are there Correct. So before we get there you know I want to understand from the context of India right you know India is moving to a 5 trillion dollar economy yes small and mid caps large family businesses are playing a big role in us achieving that that goal Correct. as as a nation uh curious to learn as you know head of research right. uh, which uh, of a fund which focuses in small and mid cap how do you view this uh in your lens uh so interesting so if you talk about india as a growth story and you know the way uh, our gdp is growing and all i believe india uh, has been a startup country so called and growing ever since independence right if you see uh, leaving aside everything india's entrepreneurial spirit is so high uh, and now i think the indian startup has also come of age and you know they're coming with a bang we are now seeing all those startups 10 12 years back coming to the capital markets and all that's a fantastic thing to happen for us so and i think going beyond also you know india's entrepreneurial spirit is going to take so that is where the whole excitement lies in this mid caps becoming uh, small cap becoming mid and mid becoming large you know at one point in time all today's large caps were maybe mid or small sometimes right so th- that's where uh, the entire excitement lies ke where you are able to identify today's small or mid which tomorrow can make it extremely large so when you bring this point you know it's so let me uh, just uh, di- uh, delve into uh, the thought process right when you say this so uh, for mid and small cap i think and sage one as a house uh, we believe in uh, growth companies okay uh, for ours imper- it's imperative that the company is growing at a very decent uh, pace Uh, our philosophy is very clear uh, mid and small caps where we hunt is that the company should be able to double its earnings in 3 to 4 years it's a very simple philosophy in that sense you have to identify those companies which will be able to deliver that what we want along with that comes uh, gaining market share you know just to give you a very small example you know i i i would not name stocks but just let me put it like that we have a stock a okay uh just pre covid uh they manufacture steel pipes okay structural steel pipes uh before covid uh, these so it's india's largest uh, steel pipe manufacturer at least let me put but before covid they had about maybe a 27% market share or something like that so covid happened uh, and you know a lot of smaller companies competitors faced all different kind of challenges because the scales were smaller right availability of raw material uh cost efficiencies were lesser and uh, this company a was acing all those parameters and today he has 50% market share of that industry okay. so what i'm trying to say is that once you have that identified and then when you keep updating yourself with that company and you're seeing that progress and that company has almost grown 5x in the last uh, few years so that is where it comes you know okay uh, a company which is growing from at least uh, as i said earning doubles in 3 to 4 years it keeps gaining in market share you have a reasonable uh, you have a very high double digit 20 plus, uh, plus percent of uh, return on equity and return on capital and then it grows even that return on equity keeps growing once you achieve economies of scale you know you become further cost efficient all this just keep starts kicking in and that's how that company creates wealth for you so all that few parameters check box is there i think it's and understanding the business of course in a very good way so over the next 10 years how do you see small and mid caps what kind of role what kind of as an investor right uh, what kind of returns or what is the expectation over the next 10 years uh so uh, darshan again uh, what i would put is see uh, i believe that in the long run it's the earnings growth of a company which eventually drives the valuation 
in the short term your multiples keep changing as we say the pe ratios keep going up and down that's a function of market sentiments and you know volatility whatever you call it in the long run run it would be all about uh, earnings growth and earnings growth and returns of the stock should merge with that but once you grow in size your multiples keep growing because you know market starts rewarding you for the stature that you achieve so i think medium and small cap it's a great place to be but at the same time you have to understand the risks associated because uh it's 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 a space which which is less research and also individual investor sometimes if he thinks he can do it by himself and that's great if he he is able to do it and all that otherwise it comes with its fair share of uh, risk and there have been instances in the past right where people have seen their wealth getting destroyed tremendously there are n number of examples in that space that you can just uh, look at in the past that they've destroyed wealth so it's very important that you if you are uh, you think you can do it then it's fine otherwise you have to trust somebody with like some pmss mutual funds or whichever other way to let them manage it also depends on your risk appetite right and you know this mid and small cap investment is a high risk high return uh, space right so it also depends on your risk appetite whether you are able to take that kind of volatility in the short term you know a lot of people they start with very very a lot of excitement and when the market delves and all that and they see their wealth coming down and you know you sell it at the wrong time or and when things are going better you enter at the top and that's a human psychology which every time happens so it's it's a very tricky investment you have to be very careful when you're doing mid and small cap investments so i would suggest that then it's that you know you should trust somebody who's been uh, very successful at that otherwise so if someone were to trust uh, a pms like sage one uh, you know what do they need to do what is the ticket size how do they approach okay. if you are okay to share uh, yeah yeah absolutely why not so uh, all our whatever sage one has to offer and everything is there on our website uh otherwise uh, you know we are there on other social medias where you can always ping us and you know our contact details are there on the website our investor can always just give a call and our team will uh, get in touch with them uh so sage one typically uh, so we have a lot of uh, we have a mid and small uh, mid and small uh, offering we have a small and micro cap fund which currently we are uh, we've closed for new subscription and then we have a sage one large cap portfolio slp is what we call it but that's a passive portfolio okay so that is uh, companies which are matured again those large caps and higher mid caps uh, there we do a passive investment uh, you don't review that on a very daily basis you know it's it's maybe by month uh, by annual or anything like that Uh, so uh, sage one takes a tick size of about 2 crores uh, and in the large cap portfolio our tick size is 50 lakhs which is sebi mandated and uh, we also have a uh, uh, aif platform you know we just completed uh, we have a first scheme which was launched in 2019 uh, and uh, we'll be launching a second scheme very soon where sebi mandated uh, investment is 1 crore minimum so that is where uh, we You're do right. that yes excellent thanks you know i think uh, i know a lot of this information is available online Correct. but i wanted to have this discussion yes. so that people have a clear idea of what it takes Correct. before you can enter or operate at such a level right, right? um now let's get into the details yes. you know we have you who's done so much research you uh pick stocks you shortlist them you do a lot of research on them um and while the information might be out there in the public in small and mid cap not all of the information is there in the public so you really have to dig deep Correct. you have to understand the promoters yes so when you research on a stock which comes on your radar you know what does it have to have for it to come on your radar and the second part of it is for you to actually deploy capital meaning Correct. you know make an investment on it sure so uh, we follow the bottom up uh, strategy darshan so we don't go top down which is like going first macro and then industry and then the stock okay we are pure bottoms up guys so we actually pick up the stock we don't believe in timing the market or anything we are not too much into cyclicals and all that because there your entry and exit has to be quite precise and we don't want to do that we don't typically want to uh, time the markets so uh, we have a set of parameters uh, which we want right 
so uh, we run those screeners ideation can be from anywhere you know some corporate action happening uh, or some you read something somewhere in newspapers magazines and you have those uh, softwares which we use to screen stocks uh, which uh, comply to our initial parameters to them for them to come on a table first uh, thereafter, uh, of course, you go up understanding the business. See, for mid and small caps and for at least forget mid small, if any other company also for that matter, at Sage One, it is very important for us to get a good understanding of the business. Valuations come secondary for us. Important is to understand the business. Uh, who, how is it run? What's the history? How has the numbers been and all that? Just to understand the growth trajectories and all that. Then you'll dial, uh, delve into the industry, you know. So what I see personally, you know, a uh, couple of things which I see. So first of all, yeah, I see the management quality, okay. The corporate governance, have there been anything in the past or, you know, so anything. Uh, so that is one. Secondly, when I look at the business, I want that business to be scalable. You know, there has to be a big opportunity in that size of that industry where this guy can re become really big and he's able to scale that business. And then would be the uh, other uh, other parameters, you know, then that uh, ROE or whatever we look at those parameters and all that. And then if we feel, okay, yes, this company has that kind of potential, you know, and then we'll probably speak to the management and we'll do our scuttlebutts where we'll probably meet uh, people outside, you know, the vendors, suppliers, buyers, etc. So that is how we go about investing. And then, uh, so even uh, whether that uh, stock will be a part of the portfolio or not, you know, Summit gives us a lot of freedom, you know, it's not like that uh, he will uh, in isolation take a decision, you know, the entire investment team will sit together and brainstorm uh, and uh, thereafter with everybody's uh, uh, unanimous decision in that way, uh, will that stock come into the portfolio. So it's, it's a very democratic process in that sense that, you know, everybody has equal say in the whole process. That's the beauty of what I like about this. Thank you for sharing, you know, getting yeah. a sneak peek into how Sage One uh, yeah. operates. Now, um, you know, we had in March 2020 a Black Swan event, yeah. right? It's a very investment focused term which is basically we had a shock in the system. That's right. Uh, and the financial markets reacted by kind of going down okay. and then the uh, you know the global central governments pumped in uh, some amount of money some stimulus and brought in some liquidity but as a fund manager it must have been difficult because in India you have March is the financial year end right. and you have April and it was those March April May June months which really where the market was extremely volatile and Correct. down yeah what was your experience, if you are willing to share, and also how did you manage that? Sure. So, see, it's a black swan which just hits you suddenly. It's a very difficult and a tricky situation to react, you know. Samit has very beautifully written a memo. If people, investors or anybody public can uh, uh, read Samit's memos, they are all online. Uh, he had written uh, that, you know, the fear of unknown unknown. Right. When COVID hit us in March, it was unknown, unknown, as you call it. So we just didn't know what to happen. And then there was that whole sell off in the subsequent months. It became known, unknown. So you knew COVID is there, but you didn't know how strong it will be. Then it will become mellow Then the second way and all. But uh, over a period of time, yeah, I think all the central banks and everybody uh, reacted very swiftly. Uh, the entire medical uh, fraternity of the world, uh, you know, uh, reacted very quickly. And it's quite amazing that you have a vaccine in like maybe 12 months of COVID hitting the world. Uh, so for us, I'll, I'll share, you know, when it happened, even after uh, the indices fell as high as 20 percent, even after that, uh, we took some call of we were there on cash a bit, but we took a call to raise some more cash. Now, there could be an argument, you know, investors also asked us that, uh, okay, for example, you you came 20% on cash or 25%, why not 50%? Now, the point is, how do you judge that and all? Just to give you a very, uh, Samit uh, keeps talking in his uh, interviews and all that. He had done a very good analysis. 
uh, in the last two decades or uh, since inception of the index at least sensex okay for example there were 10000 trading days of that and index has been up almost 250x from the time of inception and out of the 10000 days the only the 100 days uh, if you were invested that you made this 250x and 9,900 days would be with zero returns. That was fascinating. Now, so imagine if you miss those 100 days of investment, you don't make so much of returns in the market. Yeah. So then the question is that how do you time the market then? Or how if, so today I ask you Darshan that in February, I gave you a chance that uh, would you uh, want to be 100% on cash or you would want to be fully invested? In March, you would think I did a very, uh, a very good decision of being on cash. And today, in one year's time, look where you are. And if you are not invested, you've, lost you've just lost everything, right? And so it's a very tricky thing. Uh, I don't know everybody, anybody has a precise answer to this. It's even more tricky for fund managers. One good thing what happened is that when COVID happened, when markets came down, we engaged with our investors. Uh, we did calls, uh, our development team spoke to investors, maybe wherever one-on-one -on -one was required and all that. And we explained them the positions and how we are going about it. And I think I was very pleasantly surprised at the maturity of the Indian investor at this point in time. Uh, we at Sage One were very uh, amazed, even very happy, proud that uh, we had probably the least drawdowns. I mean, you know, even after such a large pandemic hit us. So I think somewhere the Indian investor is getting matured. He's understanding equity is a long-term game. Game uh, you probably don't want to uh, react uh, to such things. Yes, you have to think rationally, but uh, that's how it is. So we did not have that big a problem also because we engage with our clients again, as I said. And Samit has, we've done some uh, quantitative work and all that where we don't know, we don't want to time the market as I told you. And we were happy we didn't do that because when we raised money also in March when markets fell, I think we deployed everything in end of April and May again. So, you know, we were very happy. And then, yes, markets also rewarded as well, which in turn were handsome returns for investors. Parin, uh, this has been a great conversation so far. You know, I want to also learn a little bit about, uh, you know, the Indian fund management industry. You've been around for some time. Um, and so it's going through some drastic changes. But where do you see the Indian fund management industry? You know, what are the trends? What are some uniqueness uh, over the next few years? So, uh, Darshan, just to give you a few numbers, okay, statistics, uh, the mutual fund industry as of June 2021 is now almost 34 lakh crores. This number five years back as of June 2016 was about 13.4 lakh crores. So it's more than twofold in just five years. Take the PMS industry for that matter, you know, I think five years, six years back, PMSs, there were just a bunch of them with very little AUMs and all. Today, the PMS, I would put the entire alternate investment also probably into that. I'm not sure, but PMS I can speak of is almost 1,90,000 crores today. Uh, so I think that the fund management business as a whole in this country has really come of age, okay? Uh, the financialization, which I think a lot of stalwarts used to keep talking a decade back, I think we are seeing that happening significantly. Uh, yes, a lot of uh, credit or whatever, a lot of things go to this entire digitalization where, you know, every individual in this country is now empowered uh, with, you know, uh, access to data, be it mobiles uh, and everything, you know, uh, stock trading has become so easy on the mobile phones, right? It's so seamless. I think we are one of the few countries we should be proud of that we've adopted these technologies so seamlessly, uh, which would not there be in some of the even developed countries. And I think that has led to uh, super investments on in these industries. Just to give you another number, CDSL, a listed company, which is a depository, opened one crore new DMAT accounts in the last six months. And before that, that one crore would have taken at least 18 months or maybe 24 months for them. 
and we've done that in six months. So yes, this pandemic also helped where unfortunately some business, uh, everybody's businesses were shut and the opening has also been a very uh, topsy-turvy, you know, with uh, some lockdowns here and there and all. So, and people have understood that, you know, you, you want a second uh, income source or whatever you call it. Uh, so all that, and even as an asset class, right, equities has matured. Uh, earlier people used to just understand maybe land, real estate, then it came gold when gold prices started rising. Uh, otherwise it was just fixed income, uh, fixed income or FDs for that matter. Uh, but if you see history again, uh, wouldn't put numbers, but equities over the last maybe 20, 30 years, if you take the data cumulative, equities has given the highest returns over the last 30 years on a, a Kager basis, right? So uh, I think so that I, I think the future fund fund management in India is brilliant. I think we've we've I wouldn't say just taken off, but yeah, we are going towards that. I think the pace as so today uh, mobile phone penetration is decent, so data. But if you look at uh, broadband connections, you know we just have about ten million. That's nothing for a country like India, right? Imagine just this number going to 40, 50 million over the next decade, and the kind of data access which people will have. And that will just create further awareness and more uh, smarter or more knowledgeable investors uh, who understand this. And, you know, so I think the future for fund and fund management industry is brilliant, I think. So great time to be a part of Absolutely. the fund management. Oh, yes. You know, we have another podcast uh, speaker, uh, Mandar Matre, who's heading Apex Fund. Right. And so he's coming in and he's going to share oh, a little bit on the back end of what does fund management, Correct. you know, that how does very it operate. Interesting, so that would be a great yeah, conversation yeah, yeah. to have. Looking well. forward to listening. Um, I'm going to just turn that around and now focus on fixed deposits. You know, there's so much liquidity in the market. Uh, the interest rates have gone down. Uh, fixed deposit returns are anywhere between 6 to 7% if you take a look at it today. And so, uh, you know, not, not very healthy returns. And That's then right. you add inflation to it, uh, it, it becomes uh, a tough one for some, you know, elderly people to either That's true. park a secure uh, money. Okay. So your thoughts on the fixed deposit uh, as an instrument or overall? So... Uh, Darshan, uh, I will so before commenting on that, you know, I will just uh, look at the broader picture, you know, uh, of a retail or an individual investor. I think it becomes very important. A uh, couple of things. One is in your life cycle, at what point you are. Are you a millennial? Are you just got into your professional life? You just got married, and now you have the life in front of you. Uh, you are in your mid ages or something, or then you are a senior citizen or retired. You know, so I would spread that. Uh, and based on that, what are your financial goals? What are your financial needs? I mean, a person who's a senior citizen has lived his life and I think he wants uh, a lot more surety or extremely safe kind of an investment. So for them, yes, FDs or, you know, whatever governments, other schemes which are more secured make a lot of sense. Uh, but I think when you, uh, if you're starting investments early in your age, you know, you're a millennial and all that, I think uh, you have that appetite to take some risk, you know, uh, and I think equity is the way, pardon me, because, you know, I have been so much into equities all my life that uh, I don't see any other asset classes. I mean, personally speaking, all my money is in equities. I don't have any other asset class where I've invested. Uh, I look forward to now maybe some startup investments and things like that. And, you know, you and I have had certain chats on that as well. So, again, that would be a great place to be in. But so, as I said, so which, where in the life cycle you are and what is your risk appetite? I think entire thing is based on that. I have nothing against FDs. But personally speaking, because all my life for the last 15 years, I've been doing equity investments. Uh, I would suggest that equity, sh at least if nothing else, but it should be a little bit part of your uh, in uh, portfolio, right? Equities as an asset class. You have real estate, you have gold. I don't uh, believe so much. I think real estate also now, if you see, you know, the yields are nothing in residential. And so even in suppose commercial, for example, let me put it, you know, earlier, uh, so a yield on commercial would be 7-8% at max. 
and earlier you had need needed to buy a commercial uh, uh, place you know and it maybe cost you few lakhs or few crores of money but now you have reits which are listed you know so you can buy even 1000 rupees worth of real estate and earn that 6 7 the yields today on our reits are anywhere between 6 and a half to 8 percent in which are listed so i think why then do you need to go and buy a real estate uh, thing when you can invest through a reit or something like that so that same goes maybe for uh, maybe not extremely uh, elderly people uh, and uh, kinds but if you if you are looking at a very modest investment rather than fds Uh, reits and invits are also good investment vehicles that now you can get assured uh, fixed uh, return something and then the optionality remains in the capital gains if those reits prices or the invit prices go up you know the nbfc industry has been under a lot of stress uh, i'm curious to learn your views on this sector and maybe some trends that might be uh, coming up sure so as far uh, as much as i have looked at these nbfcs of late and what i understand from that uh surely nbfcs have had their fair share of trouble over the last uh, couple of years and especially aggravated in the covid times you know uh, because uh, lenders were not able to collect money uh, from their uh, borrowers on time and you know the growth also came not because you became co- cautious you know of uh money going bad so you also slowed down your uh, lending uh but if we speak about today i think much of the nbfc sector has now become stable uh barring whenever covid uh, escalate covid uh, pay, uh, wave ex- escalates and there are strict lockdowns or whatever it is yes at that time you have a certain problem of collection or something but i think from bad loans perspective and a lot of clean up has happened in the sector uh, if you see even uh, before covid you know at least those mbfcs which had large exposure to uh, builders and developers uh, they've had uh, seen much of the pain because you know demon happened gst happened and where a lot of money was sucked out in that sense and you know the these nbfcs were large lenders some of them and uh, you know how the builder community has collapsed now consolidated significantly and all that so uh, but there also a lot of clean up has happened uh, uh, then the arcs which happened asset reconstruction companies which were established uh, the uh, bankruptcy codes which happened so ncld hearings happened so a lot of these banks and nbfcs could recover a lot of money from even the earlier bad assets that were formed Uh, so in some cases the recoveries were as high as 80 85% but there have been recoveries only of 5 3 to 5% also but it's a mixed bag but still motor motor you recovered a lot uh, so nbfc see that there's a lot of segmentation right there are specialized uh, nbfcs who are just doing housing finance some are doing sme some are doing vehicle finance some do a lot of things so i think in this entire pack i think now the housing finance companies are much more stable with currently in the last uh, 12 18 months even the real estate sector is doing exceptionally well residential demand is come back uh, really well so uh, hfcs could grow uh, decently so overall the take is that i think uh, the sector has significantly uh, uh, stabilized uh rightly uh, at government's intervention at the right time in the last budget those credit guarantee schemes which the government uh, announced the finance minister i think they they all gave a lot of impetus uh, to 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 encourage the nbfcs to start lending so see one thing is very clear right without credit growth you cannot have a economy growing okay credit growth is essential unfortunately in the last many years india's credit growth has just been what 6 7% or maybe lower uh it is imperative that we go to the double digit mark of credit growth for re- economy to really pick up and show that double digit growth so it's a very important sector uh they they are able to uh, lend to those who are unbanked or where banks cannot enter so nbfc strategically is a very important part of india's growth story so uh so my take small take would be of course there are uh, you have to pick your uh, if you are going to invest in nbfc so i'll take it a little further that you have to pick your uh, companies very very smartly uh, to to see that uh, you know you are not stuck in some nbfc whose books may be still further 
subject to deterioration or something but i think overall there has been a lot of stability so i i i think that uh, lot of thing is now out of the trouble that is my small take on nbfc thanks you know that's a lot of clarity and a lot of insights around the sector now i want to talk about retail investors individuals you know at dasar we focus a lot on financial independence we have a 90 day program to help people manage their personal finance on the behavioral side of That's it right. um so curious to learn you know if someone were to look at you know getting financially independent or to create generational wealth right right what are the steps what are the simple behaviors what are some of the things that you would kind of guide them Correct. or suggest them to do so uh, so my view would be darshan i think in india setting your financial goals is highly underrated and people don't do it uh, i was also a part of that uh, crowd once upon a time i will not deny that but when i did it i saw how helpful it is can you elaborate i think the individual investor investor afterwards first every individual i think should actually pen down their financial goals you have to bucket it into what your short term needs will be your mid uh, mid term needs and your long term needs will be we spoke about it earlier in the podcast uh, i think it's very essential so there you can actually understand that how you can allocate your money where and what that money which you probably don't require for the next 3 4 5 years or maybe beyond that i think you should definitely invest into indian equities uh you have something coming in the short term so so basically plan it very wisely but plan i think indians we as indians don't concentrate on that aspect so well so that that's the first take on a retail investor uh thereafter uh see the other problem in india is i believe so i think in good times and all everybody thinks they are uh maybe research analysts or fund managers or whatever you know uh, everybody feels that are they know how to invest and all that uh, probably is true or not i'll not like to comment but data suggest and everything suggests that most of the time they have lost money in the market so i would suggest that if you really are good and your experience has been good you invest by yourself that's not a problem see if you're investing in the very large caps say the nifty 50 companies there probably you don't require a mutual fund or a fund manager and why you would need to give them fees because i am not going to do any value addition in a hdfc banks research it's very uh, very well uh, information is okay. abundant in public domain etc etc so i will not add any value to that so for that matter i don't know yeah allocations might differ like what weightages you give to stocks and all but probably you can do an equivalent for example if you don't want to apply too much of your head over there but when you come to investing in broader markets again going to our start of the podcast of this mid cap small cap story and all that so if you i don't know but the the experiences have been bad so there i think you should definitely have someone who can probably advise you guide you but for a retail investor eventually my point is that plan out your requirements very beautifully understand where your require at what period of time of money is and accordingly you should invest in those asset classes and if you can't do it by yourself do take advice of people who have been successful in this industry and uh, they have made in money for their investors and all that india has a, another problem probably i don't know now we have still we are coming of age but you know to share those fees and profits you know we have that somewhere ke okay, why i can do it by myself so i think you have to break that you have to come out of those shackles and you know trust some people who have been successful in the past in managing money so my small take for retail is definitely equities is something you should do but plan it wisely take some advice if you are not good at it by so simple if somebody has his own business see he must be good at his business he's been doing for a while and he's made money there investment is also similar something like a business right it's all so trust those guys if you are not good at you might be good at your work but this work somebody else is good at so you have to trust that person right and that is how we've seen money coming into this industry in fund management 
Yeah, you know, I think that's a good example that you give, which is, you know, you have your business, you're good at your business, you're making money out of the business. Right. But how do you grow your money? Correct. Is another Correct. Uh, expertise Correct. and behavior to it. Correct. Those are two different things, right? Correct. You have to put the finance behavior Correct. in place. But for the expertise, you may or may not have that knowledge and expertise. I mean, for fitness, for nutrition. Correct. You go to a nutritionist. Right. So, you know, why not this? Exactly. And so, uh, point taken, I think that's yes. really good. Uh, my last question to you, uh, Parin, is, you know, if there was one thing that you wanted to see change in the investment world, uh, you know, today, based on your experience, what would that be? So, definitely. So, if you see today, one of the biggest challenges for a modern day investor is the sheer volume and the pace of information that is coming. I'm sure on a daily basis, the amount of WhatsApps and all you get, Darshan, I don't think even 10% is what you will read, right? And what to read, how to filter it, uh, that's so much necessary, right, today. I think we all are in our daily lives bombarded with information left, right and center. So what I would love to see is, you know, some tools and maybe or you yourself uh, coming up with something or how you can filter those informations you know there's so much of fake news around us right even in the financial world today somebody putting something on twitter and that crypto is just going off the roof right what nothing just a twitter a tweet that you need uh, some fake news is here and there and things like that. So I think the responsibility also lies on those platforms somewhere. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking too much of a very noble thing or no, philosophical. I think anything is available. Like. But I think so. I think onus lies on everybody somewhere that uh, those guys who are putting the who are getting this information on that platform they can probably vet it in a way. And for us, we could probably look out for something where we can filter that and for new age entrepreneurs if we can develop a tool <laughs> wherein we can uh, significantly uh, try to uh, filter those informations i would love to see that happening someday i think there are a few people who probably are working in this way uh, this space uh, let's see how that turns out to be but that That's would be excellent. very interesting you know i think um, you know one of the reasons why i started the sir was to filter the most contextual insights right uh, yes. by bringing in experienced people such as yourself right. yeah i've seen right. all your podcasts and that's exactly i love them and it's so precise to the point and they they really speak what is there you know you are filtering the noise out of that whole thing because you know i think the learning in the books in people in the information in the videos is all out there correct. but what do i look how correct. do i discover how correct. do i get this curated correct you know i think I don't think enough people value the curation, uh, you know, the value of that curation, Absolutely. the time that goes in it, Correct. getting the right, right people, Correct. right, and uh, getting them to share the right context. Correct. I think that uh, that is very fascinating yeah. to me and, and that is why I do what I do at Dasar. Correct. And, you know, I mean, I know you. people... Have, <laughs> no, no, and I completely... That is why we also love to come on such platforms that hopefully, you know, we make sense and right. we can probably... Des uh, whatever little we've learned being in the industry is what we can impart. Uh, you know, today, like, there are research analysts just who's become Twitter analysts and, you know, putting up data. They might be correct. I'm not denying but how do you interpret and then believe that it's, you know, whether to invest or not and all those things, you know, it becomes people have their personal agendas. Let sure. me put it that way. So that's hopefully that if that changes, that would be great. I mean, people would make less mistakes, much more wiser decisions and it would be good for them. Absolutely. And good for the society. Good for the society. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this has been a fantastic podcast, oh, yeah. Parin. Thanks a lot for Thank joining you, us and it was sharing such a this. Pleasure, so, yeah. Thank um, you. I hope all of you found this podcast useful. Uh, I've learned a lot. I continue to learn a lot from Parin Bhai. Um, uh, he will be with us uh, joining Dasar Club. So if you are someone who's looking to manage uh, your personal finance, manage your money, uh, move towards financial independence, join Dasar Club, right? You're going to get a chance to interact with people like Parin Gala and more. Um, if you like this podcast, hit that button, that thumbs up over there. Uh, it'll help us. Drop in a comment. If you want us to bring in some speakers, uh, I'd be happy to reach out to them on your behalf and get them on this podcast. And I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.